today okay so today uh, we will be discussing about uh, fast hagen icu uh, this is a very basic topic uh, related to critical care nursing and uh, once it is done uh, faithfully and sincerely it can uh, uh, very much improve the outcomes of our icus Uh, the, why do we need fast hug? Because the ICU environment is challenging. Uh, critical care is extremely complex with many of surprises, uncertainties, many sources of information, like the information is coming from the ventilator, information is coming from the monitor, from the infusion pumps, and from the patient himself. And there are various interruptions and multitasking is going on. Like uh, the patient has to go for CT scan, the patient has to go for endoscopy, the patient has to go for various other investigations, MRIs, and along with that, uh, we have to see the sectioning part also, we have to see the feeding part also, and uh, the, the ongoing medication also, infusion also. So multitasking is going on at, uh, at different levels. So when uh, so much of multitasking is going on, mistakes are bound to happen. And errors of omission are quite common because we have to see a lot of things. So errors of omission, omission means that uh, we might be uh, we might be missing something. So such errors will eliminate, or we if, we if we don't do such errors, we can eliminate the potential mortality and morbidity benefit. So this will uh, result if we uh, do such omissions in our day to day activities. This can result in patient harm, and this can be very deadly in our ICUs. So there is a requirement for a simple strategy to encourage teamwork and improve the quality of care received by the ICU patients. We need to speak one language all over India, all, all over the world that, okay, this is one language we're speaking about of the quality of care in ICU. And everyone knows that, okay, this language you are speaking, this language uh, I am also. So uh, we need to be on a common platform to give a standard of care to our ICU patients. Therefore, uh, this fast hugs BID was developed. It was earlier developed by Jean Roy Vincent in Belgium in 2005, and it was revised in 2009. He invented fast hug. It was a tool used to ensure that 11 essential aspects of patient care are not forgotten by the ICU team, which are very essential, right? And sometimes uh, we uh, may or may not be you know, remembering all this. But if we remember it as a mnemonic, then we can uh, very well remember it and impart this care. So what we uh, will do, uh, all these components uh, one, uh, one on by. So it will be an interactive session. Uh, I'll put up questions and uh, I want all of you to write in the chat boxes whatever you feel is the answer and then we can discuss over it. I'll put in the question and uh, then I'll wait for a minute and then we'll start with the discussion. So first question, when to start feeding a critically ill patient in shock? The options, within 24 hours, within 48 hours, no feeds to be given in a shocked patient, and no feeds at all in critically ill patients. So what do the participants feel when to start feeding a critically ill patient in shock? I have very specifically said critically ill patient in shock. So whether we want to uh, start the feeding within 24 hours, within 48 hours, we don't feed any patient in shock or we don't feed any patient in ICU at all. So what all you feel is the answer, please type. I can see the chat box. One answer has come up within 48 hours. I'm waiting for some more answers, please. This is an interactive session. Whatever you feel, I mean, uh, whatever you feel is right, whatever you're practicing, that may be right, that may be wrong. We can discuss it later on, but there is uh, uh, no hindrance. Uh, there should be no hindrance in, partic in participating. Please. Any more answers? Any more answers? I've just got one answer within 48 hours. I have specifically said a critically ill patient in shock. In shock. Okay. So, uh, okay, so uh, the answer is that, okay, I'll just elaborate. Whenever we receive a patient in ICU, we have to start the feeds 
as soon as possible. There is no time limit. We have to start the feeds as soon as possible. It can be within 24 hours also. But when we talk of a patient in shock, then we have to be very specific and we have to wait for the patient to come out of shock or at least respond to whatever resuscitation we have done. And once the shock even starts improving, that is the time we can start feeding a patient. But again, we have to see when the patient is in ICU, we have to see why the patient is not being fed. So F, the first element that is for feeding. And all ICU patients should receive enteral nutrition within 48 hours of admission to the ICU unless it is contraindicated. So what are all the contraindications to enteral nutrition? Please, you can type in the chat box. What are all the contraindications to enteral nutrition? Again, I'm waiting, waiting for a uh, few seconds. All ICU patients should receive enteral nutrition as uh, one uh, participant has said within 48 hours. Within 48 hours of admission to the ICU unless contraindicated. But what are the contraindications? When do we don't give any feeds to the patient, enteral feeds to the patient? Any answers? Okay. So there are certain con contraindications to enteral nutrition. Uh, number one is, number one, you have just talked about that the patient is in shock. The patient, we, we see the patients with septic shock or with cardiogenic shock, whatever the cause may be. If the patient is in shock, we wait for the patient to, imp uh, to improve, come out of the shock state, and then we start the feeds. And okay, and uh, other contraindications like peritonitis or the generalized peritonitis. Now, local peritonitis is not a contraindication. Generalized peritonitis is a contraindication to start of enteral feeds. And the other uh, contraindications, like uh, earlier we used to say that, okay, the gut surgery has gone, like pancreatitis is there, we don't feed the patient. So they are not the contraindications. Surgery is, in fact, has been found that whenever uh, we start initial early feeds, the patient is found to be better. The mortality benefit is there. We start the feeds as soon as possible in ICU, ideally within 20, 48, 48 hours, but wait for the shock to at least improve, not resolve fully, but at least improve before we start the feeds. What are the benefits of nutritional support? We maintain and we replete the normal nutritional status. We support the immune function and reduce the septic complications and thus mortality. So nutrition, uh, what are benefit we are getting? That we are maintaining or if the patient is deficient, we are repleting that nutritional status of the patient. We are supporting the immunity of the patient by giving adequate nutrition and we are reducing the septic complications. But what are the barriers to adequate feeding? We Everyone knows that, okay, uh, we had a class that uh, we have to feed, start feeding very early. But what are the barriers? Why are we not able to feed the patients? Because the patient has to go for CT scan, MRI, endoscopy, out of ICU. The patient is waiting for some procedure like bronchoscopy, endoscopy, tracheostomy, or the patient has to go for uh, surgery. So when, uh, like it is said, then uh, all of you know that whenever you do a CPR, the hands of time has to be less than 10 seconds. Similarly, when the patient is in ICU, we have to think, we have to think that, okay, why the patient is not being fed? The test had to be done at 12 noon. Now it is 2 p.m. Why I am not feeding the patient? Why can't I start the feeds? The patient has undergone the tracheostomy now. Why can't I start the feed? So whenever you feel that, okay, I have interrupted the nutrition for this test or for this procedure or for this surgery, when can I start the feed? So in other way around, if we think that way, that, okay, this patient uh, I am seeing, I am not able, I am not feeding this patient. Why? The question should be why? Why I am not feeding the patient? And if we don't feed, get any answer, we have to start the feeds. The other barrier is blocked tubes. The tube is blocked, feed giant area. So we think about and we do a regular flushes. And 
again coming to the point that all uh, many procedures like small procedures like tracheostomy or even uh, bronchoscopy and all they don't need a long fasting time the patient doesn't need to be off for feeding for a long period of time a, even tracheostomy or bronchoscopy can be done without fasting also and because uh, if the once the patient is uh, intubated if the patient is extubated okay we can do some fasting but if the patient is intubated especially we don't need a prolonged fasting for small procedures like tracheostomy or bronchoscopy and all they can be done without fasting also so next is a and s uh, f is for feeding a is for analgesia and s is for sedation so administration of sedation and analgesia is important it is important to ensure a patient comfort okay so just uh, uh, imagine that a patient is lying with central line or endotracheal tube rails tube foley's or some drain is also there so it will be very uncomfortable for the patient so uh, to provide pain and to provide uh, comfort uh, will be our first priority to so ensure the patient comfort and it will reduce cardiovascular and immunologic responses because if the patient is not comfortable it will increase the inflammatory response of the patient and it will reduce the sympathetic drive also so if we provide adequate sedation and analgesia it will decrease that sympathetic drive and we been able to reduce cardiovascular and immunologic responses it will facilitate care process and it will also minimize harm to the staff if the patient is very violent we give adequate sedation and analgesia it can be uh, the sometimes we feel that we, uh, the staff is also injured so we can able to prevent that in some situations also but when we are sedating or when we are uh, giving this sedative agents to a patient we have to assess the degree of sedation and analgesia along with the respiratory depression caused by the sedative agents can decrease the weaning from mechanical ventilation splinting and ineffective coughing can increase the risk of nosocomial pneumonia like we see the patients when uh, with blunt trauma chest with the uh, fractured ribs uh, if we don't provide adequate analgesia they are not able to cough out the secretions and this can increase the risk of nosocomial pneumonia so right now what protocol we are following is that non invasive ventilation with adequate analgesia is the key for the better outcome of the patient with blunt trauma chest and for any matter for any patient that, that matter uh, if the patient even if the post op patient is there uh, if there is ineffective coughing it will increase the risk of nosocomial pneumonia it is very important to give adequate sedation and analgesia and we don't want to overdo it and we don't want to underdo it if we overdo it uh, the patient can uh, have can be very drowsy and uh, like if we uh, give too, too many uh, higher doses of uh, sedative agents it can increase the risk of maybe intubation also sometimes so we must monitor and titrate the drugs to assessment and treatment there are various uh, sedation scores uh, and analgesia uh, pain score basically uh, we can uh, assess the pain depending on the 0, zero to 10 numeric pain intensity scale we can have visual analog scale or we can have a richter sedation agitation scale depending on our institutional policies and all we can have any of these scales uh, 0 to 10 numeric pain intensity score is a pain score visual analog scale is a pain score and then richter agitation scale is a, again a sedation score used to assess the patient so this we see in almost uh, all the icus now richter sedation agitation scale and uh, this is quite commonly used here if we see uh, we have to keep the patient in the range 3 to 4 3 to 4 means the patient is either halka uh, halka sedated or the patient is calm and cooperative we don't want a agitated patient and we don't want a very sedated patient so if the patient goes to a sedation score of 5 we increase the sedation dose if the sedation, uh, the uh, scale is 2 we decrease the sedation so please remember it if the sedation score is high that means the patient needs more high dosage of sedation agents if the sedation score is less the we need to reduce on the dosage of the sedative agent 
we have to keep the target of our sedation in the range of three to four. The patient should be either sedated or should be calm and cooperative. That is what our goal is. So pain and sedation to be assessed on all ICU patients at least six hourly utilizing standardized assessment tools. And it has been documented on the ICU nursing flow sheet. So all the ICUs have a mixture uh, RS, RASS and the visual analog scales on their nursing sheets. Okay, so next question, which is the preferred drug with all this discussion on uh, ICU sedation? Which is the preferred drug for ICU sedation to prevent ICU delirium? Please, you can type in the chat box. Which is the preferred drug for ICU sedation to prevent ICU delirium? We want the patient to be sedated, but we don't want delirium also. When the patient gets up after we switch off the sedation, we don't want the patient to be delirious. Which drug should be preferred? But all you are doing may be right, may be wrong. Please type whatever you feel is right. Propofol, midazolam, dexmeritomidine, or atracurium, which is the preferred drug for ICU sedation to prevent ICU delirium. And specifically, again, telling to prevent ICU delirium. We don't want a delirious patient in ICU. A delirious patient in ICU, we again want again want patients to sedate and all, all these complications. We don't want a delirious patient we just want a patient to be calm and cooperative, but we don't want a delirious patient. Okay, right. Midazolam, I'm getting as the answers. Midazolam, I'm getting as the answers. So, midazolam, uh, practically, midazolam is the preferred drug for ICU sedation. Uh, but if we talk of ICU delirium, then the preferred drug is dexmeritomidine. Dexmeritomidine is ideal drug for ICU sedation. You don't use much of dexmeritomidine if the patient is in shock because it is an uh, uh, alpha agonist agent and it will decrease the BP, it will decrease the heart rate. We don't want the, the uh, we don't want to use dexmeritomidine in a, a patient who is in shock. So therefore, uh, we most commonly use midazolam. But if we talk of ICU delirium, if the patient is not in shock, then the preferred drug nowadays is dexmetomidine for using for ICU sedation. Okay, atracurium. Atracurium is a sedative agent or a paralyzing agent? What is atracurium? Please type in the chat box. What is atracurium? Is it a sedative agent or a paralyzing agent? It is a paralyzing agent. It is a paralyzing agent. It doesn't sedate the patient. It just paralyzes. So whenever you start atracurium, it paralyzes the patient. So we have to sedate the patient along with a paralyzing agent. This is, uh, uh, I mean, you can say the point that uh, we just can't paralyze the patient without sedation. We have to sedate and then paralyze. And paralyzing agent, as we already know, that paralyzing agent also be used rarely in ICU, and there are only few indications are there for paralyzing the patients, right? Okay, so the question is, and the answer to this question is dexmeritomidine. If we talk of ICU delirium, ICU sedation, okay, the most common agent is midazolam. But if we talk of ICU delirium, then the preferred agent should be dexmeritomidine. Okay, right. So next question: Which intervention decreases the ICU mortality the most? Which one intervention? decreases the ICU mortality the most. Is it VTE prophylaxis? VTE is venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. Stress ulcer prophylaxis with PPIs or pentoprazole or esomeprazole or omeprazole. Hand washing or early ambulation. So which one intervention will decrease the mortality the most? We use, uh, we know that hand washing will decrease the infection rates we know early ambulation will increase uh, the patient outcomes, but which one intervention decreases the mortality the most? So the answer is VTE prophylaxis. So this is nowadays a standard of care, and this is uh, the quality of ICU is also adjudged on this that whether you are uh, monitoring the VTE prophylaxis being given to the patient or not. 
तो टी इज फॉर थ्रोम्बो एम्बोलिक प्रोफाइल एक्सिस तो कंसिडरेबल मोर्टेलिटी एंड मोर्बिडिटी एसोसिएटेड विद विनर थ्रोम्बो एम्बोलिम इन हॉस्पिटलाइज पेशेंट इज बीन फाउंड दैट इफ वी स्क्रीन दी आई सी पेशेंट्स more than 25% of our patients in icu will have the thromboembolism whether they present that with or not whether the symptoms with uh, or not but we have uh, we see that around more than 25% of patients on screening will have venous thromboembolism and vte includes both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and this is the single most preventable cause of hospital associated death in medical in patients we can prevent it we can prevent it by giving vte prophylaxis so icu patients are all at risk population for vte and why because of the pre morbid conditions by like uh, uh, surgery or sepsis or icu activities like sandwich catheterization invasive tests and procedures or even drugs because the most common or the most important risk factor for vte is immobility and the icu patient is immobile so the patients all icu patients are at risk for vte and we need to provide them with thrombo prophylaxis and if uh, the we are not able why we are not able to give pharmaco prophylaxis we'll just just discuss uh, we can give pharmaco prophylaxis or we can give mechanical prophylaxis pharmaco prophylaxis means we can give heparin or low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinux or uh, unfractionated heparin we can give and if we are not able to give any pharmaco prophylaxis any anticoagulants because of thrombocytopenia because of severe coagulopathy because of any active bleeding or of recent intracerebral hemorrhage that is a, these are the contraindications to the use of anticoagulants if you are not able to give uh, the heparins because of any of these reasons then we can think of mechanical vte prophylaxis then we go on for the mechanical or the non pharmacological therapies like pneumatic compression devices thromboembolic stockings or early ambulation or range of motion exercises so out of these the first two the pneumatic compression devices or the thromboembolic stockings for a immobile patient have to be used if we are not able to use the anticoagulants so these two have to be used either of these two have to be used for uh, vte prophylaxis so either uh, we are able to give anticoagulants if there is a contraindication we are not able to use anticoagulants we can use non pharmacological therapies again the question in our mind should be okay i have been assigned this patient why i am i not able to give any vte prophylaxis if my patient is not uh, getting why why can't we start anticoagulants if not anticoagulants why can't we start the mechanical prophylaxis so if the patient has to be either on mechanical or on pharmacological thrombo prophylaxis that is a must in icu so unless contraindicated some form of thrombo prophylaxis should be used in all icu patients okay uh, decisions regarding the initiation of prophylaxis should be individualized and based on patient risk factors like uh, if the patient has a head injury or the patient is of trauma or the patient is of intracerebral bleed we don't want the patient to be started on anticoagulants we start with the mechanical prophylaxis but again if the patient is a patient with limb injury we can't apply the uh, stockings also we can't apply the pneumatic machine devices also then what to do then again we have to think of and discuss that what all we can do for the venous thrombo prophylaxis and it should be reviewed daily and it the plan should be changed if necessary uh, i mean our my icu has a review sheet of the vte prophylaxis we assess the patient and we then uh, assign whether the patient should be on thrombo prophylaxis or whether the patient should be on mechanical thrombo prophylaxis so either of these has to be used that is a must in icu next is uh, h F F is for feeding, A is for analgesia, S is for sedation, and uh, T is for thrombo prophylaxis. H is for head end of the bed. So we have nowadays the motorized beds. We can see the angle also, and we can change the angle. And we have to keep the uh, head end of the bed positioning 
uh, we have it has been found that if we keep the head end of the bed less than 30 degrees during the first 24 hours of mechanical ventilation it is independently associated with increased risk of ventilator associated pneumonia and increase uh, along with it number one it will decrease the risk of ventilator associated pneumonia number two it will reduce the risk of aspiration and uh, uh, I mean, further uh, pneumonia. So again, the same thing. So head end of the bed has to be at least 30 degree and ideally between 30 to 45 degree to reduce the risk of aspiration and to reduce the risk of pneumonia. So semi-recumbent positioning is an acceptable intervention for pneumonia prevention in mechanical ventilated patients and all mechanical ventilated patients should have the head end of the bed elevated at least 30 degrees unless there is any Contraindication. Then U is for stress ulcer prophylaxis. We uh, have to give stress ulcer prophylaxis to all the ICU patients because GA bleeding can cause prolonged hospitalization, increased length of stay in the ICU. It can increase significantly increase the mortality, and the patients should receive stress ulcer prophylaxis to prevent any gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Why? Okay, we'll discuss why. Which is the most important risk factor for upper GI bleed in critically ill patient? Severe sepsis, mechanical ventilation for more than 48 hours, use of anticoagulants or both B and A and B. Which is the most important risk factor for upper GI bleed in a critically ill patient? Is it severe sepsis? Is it mechanical ventilation for more than 48 hours? Use of anticoagulants or the first two options? Which is the most important risk factor? You can type the answer in chat box, please. I'm just waiting for a few uh, seconds. Which is the most important risk factor? What do you feel? Which is the right answer? Okay, so someone had severe sepsis. So again, see the options. Severe sepsis, mechanical ventilation for more than 48 hours, use of anticoagulants, or both A and B. Okay, so severe sepsis is one of the important risk factors for upper GI bleed. The two most important risk factors are severe sepsis, and mechanical ventilation for more than 48 hours. So these two are the most important risk factors. Okay, if we have to uh, tick one, then it should be severe sepsis, but these, both of these two, severe sepsis and mechanical ventilation more than 48 hours, they are the most important risk factors for upper GI bleed in critically ill patients. And uh, just if, when you go to ICU, just see around how many patients are intubated and how many patients are in severe sepsis. So almost all the ICU patients must be uh, will be on mechanical ventilation and almost all the patients will be having severe sepsis also. So all the patients are at the risk factor for upper GI bleed and they have to be on the PPE prophylaxis. PPE means a uh, proton pump inhibitor has to be used as infusion or as uh, not as an infusion as a a regular uh, uh, OD or a BD dose depending upon the agent being used, but stress ulcer prophylaxis has to be used in almost all the critically ill patients because severe sepsis and mechanical ventilation for more than 48 hours are the most important risk factors for upper GI bleed in critically ill patients. We Nowadays, we use pentoprazole, we use esomeprazole, we use omeprazole, or we can use ranadidin also. But ideally, we are using nowadays PPIs. And then, uh, where, what are the prophylactic agents we can use? We can uh, uh, now we are using uh, omeprazole, or we can start uh, on patient on sucralfit. We can start the patient on ranitidine, famotidine, or the PPIs. These are all the uh, options we have. Or we can start early enteral nutrition also. That is not considered a part of ulcer prophylaxis, but these are. So we have to be uh, starting the patient on one of these agents for the ulcer prophylaxis as well. 
according to surviving sepsis guidelines next question according to surviving sepsis guidelines what should be the target blood sugar level in a patient with sepsis according to surviving surviving sepsis guidelines what should be the target blood sugar level of a patient in sepsis it should be whether it should be less than 80 whether it should be 80 to 110 mg percent whether it should be 140 to 180 or whether it should be 180 to 220 what should be the target blood sugar level for a patient in sepsis according to surviving sepsis guidelines 80 to 110 is considered the tight glycemic control 140 to 180 is considered the glycemic control and according to the surviving sepsis guidelines we have to give insulin if the patient's blood sugar level goes beyond 180 okay hyperglycemia is uh harmful definitely more than 180 blood sugar shouldn't be the target we have to lower that but too low a sugar level we don't want hypoglycemia at all we can compensate we can allow a blood sugar around 140 to 180 but we don't want the sugar to be in this range we don't want the sugars to go less than 80 and the patient to be in hypoglycemia because that can be dangerous for the brain the patient can have neuroglycopenia and the it can be dangerous for the patient's brain we don't want the patient to be having blood sugar of less than 80 and if we keep a target of 80 to 110 it is very likely that we will have some instances of patient going to hypoglycemia which we don't want so now the sepsis guideline says that the blood sugar level in almost all the icu patients or at least in all the sepsis patients should be 140 to 180 and we have to give insulin if the patient's blood sugar level goes beyond 180 so this is out of question this is out of question it has to be this or this but this is likely to push the patient into hypoglycemia so the most preferred is that to target a blood sugar level of 140 to 180 so in any septic patient you don't target a sugar of around 100 you target a sugar of around 150 to prevent any hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia induced brain injury can be irreversible also and therefore in order to prevent that brain injury we don't want any hypoglycemia therefore a liberal blood sugar level of at least 140 to 180 should be maintained in almost all the icu patients so g is for glycemic control high blood sugar levels are associated with poor patient outcomes high blood glucose increases infectious complications but again hypoglycemia is more dangerous so we have to target the blood sugar level of 140 to 180 next uh this uh this is a uh, fast hug f is for feeding a is for analgesia s is for sedation a t is for thromboprophylaxis h is for head and up u is for ulcer prophylaxis g is for glycemic control note now uh this was revised later on this is not the original fast hug then it was revised later on and the few further elements were started and uh this we are already doing but if we use it as a mnemonic then it will be better so that is s s is for spontaneous breathing trial so whichever patient whoever patient is on ventilator we have to give a spontaneous breathing trial whether it is on a t piece or whether it should be on a ventilator on a spontaneous mode or a cpap with pressure support mode depending on all the modes we can use but the, it has to be a spontaneous breathing mode so spontaneous breathing trial has to be given to all the patients who are on ventilator either on a t piece or on a ventilator but uh, we have to try a spontaneous breathing trial of maximum 2 hours not more than 2 hours maximum 2 hours whether the patient is able to spontaneously breathe or not and during that breathing trial if the patient shows uh, any sign of deterioration whether it is hypoxia or tachycardia or tachypnea or bradypnea or hypertension or hypotension any change in vitals which you think are because of this 
spontaneous breathing trial. You put the patient back on controlled mode of ventilation and then wait for the next day and then for the whole day. And for the next day only, we give the second breathing trial. So as is for spontaneous breathing trial, each patient on ventilator has to be given a spontaneous breathing trial. Okay. So try and try again daily. We can't go wrong every time. We have to be successful and we have to keep on trying daily. Next B, uh, uh, this is for uh, surgical patients and if even for medical patients as well. B is for bowel care. GI problems in critically ill patients are common and are associated with impaired outcome and assess for the movement of bowel, whether the bowel sounds are there or not and what is the number, what is the consistency and what is the color of the stools the patient is passing. So we have to assess the movement of bowel, whether the patient has passed stools or not. Then I is for indwelling catheters. Again, we have to ask the question, uh, is there any unwanted catheter the patient is having? The central line, are we done with the central line? Whether the patient needs central line or not, why can't we take it out? Again, the same question for urinary catheter, why can't I take it out? Again, for the drains also, intercostal drain or abdominal drain or even to dialysis catheter, why can't I take this catheter out? That should be a question. And if the answer is yes, take out that catheter. Okay, So this will reduce any infectious complications to the patient. So remove any unwanted catheter. We have just talked about the endotracheal tube and now the unwanted catheter. Then the de-escalation of antibiotics. Revise the antibiotic orders. Again, uh, it is a routine practice to write the number of days the prescribed antibiotics has been going on. Like it is a day one for uh, piperacillin tazobactam, day two for ticoplanin. So write all the days, how many days the antibiotic has gone and de-escalate the antibiotics according to the culture reports or once the duration is over. So discuss the duration with the clinician. What should be the duration of the antibiotics we are starting? Whether we are going to stop it after five days, seven days, 10 days or 15 days. There are various durations for various antibiotics. There are various durations for various disease processes. So this is again individualized. But nowadays, all the research is showing that the shorter duration of antibiotics is beneficial and it will reduce the bacterial resistance as well. So we have to uh, shift over to the shorter duration of antibiotics and switch to the lowest possible duration of the antibiotics and lowest possible in the quality wise also and lowest possible duration wise also. So in summary, assess each patient daily to see if they are receiving each element of fast hug. Incorporate fast hug reminders into daily patient care. Whenever you do, whenever you are assigned a patient, just uh, revise this mnemonic, whether I am feeding the patient or not, whether I am giving analgesia or sedation to the patient, what is the sedation level, whether we want to increase or decrease the sedation level, T, whether we, the patient is giving, getting any thromboprophylaxis or not, is the head end of the bed elevated, is the patient getting any ulcer prophylaxis, is the patient uh, glycemic control is maintained or not. So all these uh, reminders can be uh, how, uh, can be uh, we can have a placard and we can have all the reminders in our ICUs just to make the staff learn and incorporate into the daily patient care. So uh, if there are any questions uh, to this, so given a again reminder, so uh, put these reminders in your ICUs if you have not done and whenever you are assigned a patient, just ask yourself whether I have given a fast talk today or not. So I am waiting for the questions. If there are any, you can type uh, in the chat box. Any questions I am waiting. Please, you can type in the chat box.
I'll wait for a few minutes. Wait for any questions. Okay, the question uh, which uh, you have to tell me uh, succinyl choline is a paralyzing agent or a sedative agent? Succinyl choline is a paralyzing agent or a sedative agent? Okay, succinyl choline is a paralyzing agent. Okay, so please you can uh, type in the chat box which all sedative agents you know. Which all sedative agents you know. Along with it, I am just uh, waiting for the questions on the fast tag also. Okay. So one thing I want to add, whenever you are assigned a patient and you see that, okay, the patient is being fed, why am I not feeding the patient? Is the, my patient comfortable? Is he pain free? And uh, what sedation is to be used? But when we are sedating a patient, uh, we have to give a sedation vacation also. If the patient is on sedation and paralyzing agent, we have to do a daily sedation vacation and uh, see the response, whether the patient is conscious or not, able to move all four limbs or not, and if the, we can go off with the sedation or not, whether the patient is comfortable without patient, sedation or not. If the patient is not comfortable with, without sedation, we can restart the sedation, but uh, we have to uh, give uh, a daily sedation vacation to almost all the patients. And there are, there are contraindications for sedation vacation if the patient is on high oxygen requirement, but uh, we have to give a daily sedation vacation to all the patients if there is no contraindication. We have to stop the paralyzing agent and we have to stop the sedation also once in 24 hours and see. Okay, so uh, one another question. Which all ulcer prophylaxis you are uh, giving to your patients and in what dosages? Pantoprazole, omeprazole or esomeprazole? I think many of us will say pantoprazole or esomeprazole. Okay, I see one answer. Pentoprazole. Okay, so pentoprazole 40 mg OD. Okay, so you have not mentioned the root IV or oral. IV or oral or through RT. According to patient, okay. If the patient is on Riles tube feed, you will give the pantoprazole tablet or not? Okay, so we have to be very careful that uh, uh, we have to be very sure 
we have to discuss with the pharmacologist whether we can crush and the tablet and give it in the RT or not. We have to be very sure and we have to discuss with the pharmacologist, our pharmacologist, whether we can crush the tablet and give it in the RT. Okay. So for all the drugs, it is not for only for pentoprazole, but all the drugs, whether it is enteric coated or because there are various formulations of various drugs. So we have to discuss with the pharmacologist whether we can crush the drug and give it to RT. Okay. The other options we can have, we can give omeprazole, we can give S omeprazole, and we can give sucralfate also in the doses of 5 ml TDS or 6 hourly. Okay. Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay, so there are no more questions. So I think we can end the session here. So thank you all for uh, attending and uh, for the patient hearing and for participating also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.